I see, I see. Yeah, no, no, no. No, but in which, oh, uh, it was in the R1 that I was able to do it. I see, I see. Oh, my sis. That's okay. What well, mystery story. <laughs> While we wait a few minutes for starting any questions from the assignments. Oh. <laughs> if I mean to finish Francis. <laughs> Any, any announcement now, right? Any announcement we have to do? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right, right. I was going to do that last. Oh. Okay. Is there a link? No. Yeah, there is a link. You have to click on the, the picture. I have not Oh, interesting. Okay. okay. Anyway, let's let's use this one. Let's use this one. Maybe a survey is down or something. Guys, a, a quick announcement before uh, starting the lecture today. Um, there is this International High Performance Computing Summer School happened this year. It's going to be in Slovenia, in Ljubljana. Wonderful place, wonderful wines. Um, and we encourage you guys to apply because it's mostly aimed for students, postdocs, researchers. It's all free. That's the beauty of the program. So if you apply, you get to go to Europe for free, stay one week learning. Uh, parallel techniques, OpenMP, MPI, OpenACC, a uh, bunch of things, really interesting. Uh, it's very competitive though, but it's worth to try. So if you have questions or, or any doubts, that is one of the organizers. So. <laughs> Check it out. It's aimed at grad students that have parallel programming. Um, it's, a, it's a collaboration between uh, and uh, Exceed. The national equivalence exceeds in states, rates, right. uh, and I can, and they run big triple centers. So uh, you'll get experts from those countries. 
first hand. Uh, there's 10 spots in Canada available. Free uh, to apply. Apply doesn't cost anything. Uh, doesn't cost anything to your advisor or group or lab, neither. A week of your time. So check it out. Uh, you have to write those proposals because of bots. So uh, tell why you can use search. What you've already done, mentioned. Uh, if you have any previous parallel programming experience or just parallel content, uh, all of that. And yeah, there is questions. something about research. Oh, it's yeah, so embedded. Yeah, how it affects the research. The idea is up to, since it's paid for, up to people. So it's either useful for your studies or useful to tell, tell your application what it is. Just because you like to learn it, I don't know. If that doesn't cut it, though, uh, you can come to the uh, Ontario Summer School, too, which is going to be roughly in July, I'm guessing. Um, which is local here at, at the uh, covers a lot of the, the same stuff, but it's not international, so this is a really good point. Yeah. It's also good uh, visualization. Right. If you're interested in science, be a stream related science. That's right. So there will be different topics, but um, they'll be announced uh, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. The, the, oh, that, the deadline is uh, February 15th for application. So if you do decide, you don't have that long, that much longer. Okay. So last class we uh, started to view the process of debugging. Any questions from that? Uh, we quickly take a look at uh, GDB, one of the, bugger, the debuggers that we can use. We actually look at an example that we are going to continue to, to take a look today again. Um, did everyone find more bugs in that example? We fixed a couple of bugs. Remember, there was a, an array that it wasn't allocated. There was a square root of a negative number that was being taken. Um, as I told you, there are a couple more of, of bugs embedded in the code. So with the excuse of, of uh, learning another tool, we're going to, to look at the code again. And the tool I want to show you today is called Bygrind. Um, it's, it's a set of tools, actually, it's very neat. The bad news is that it doesn't run in mobile term. So if you are using one of the emulators in Windows, it's not going to, to work for you. In Mac OS, it can be fishy. Uh, it can give false positives. So be aware of that. And yeah, try to, to grab a Linux box and try it because it's really, really cool. So the, the tool that we are going to see in this first part of the class uh, in the second, we're going to see something for profiling. But the, the, in this part, we're going to see something for uh, checking memory errors that not always give segmentation faults. Uh, the segmentation faults happen when you are actually out of bound in an array, but you are touching another piece of the memory that is being used by another program or another variable or, or by the operating system. Um, uh, what Bygram does is intercept each memory call and checks them. It's very thoughtful, but it can be slow. Uh, find illegal accesses and initialize values, and, and very interestingly, memory leaks. Memory leaks is when you actually have a reserve, a piece of the memory for your program, but at the end, you don't release that memory. So the memory that your program is, is using is leaking, and at the end, if your program runs a lot, or if your program uses a lot of memory, it can crash, uh, it can just uh, read of the memory, you, you, uh, you don't have more memory available. It's, it's quite verbose, we are going to see some examples and use some external libraries. Uh, it's, sorry, when you use some external libraries, it can give you some false positives, like, like I was saying for, for, for the Mac. So this was our, uh, our code that we saw last class. It was a code that simply used an array to, uh, to say the square root of some integers uh, that was given by the command line. And then it keeps track of those squares uh, roots in a, in a variable called sum. Okay, so with comments there, I'm, I'm uh, indicating the, the errors that we fix. So we allocate the memory for the array, which wasn't done at the beginning. And then we fix um, the square roots of the negative numbers. 
right? So it's the code fix. OK, let's see. Uh, let's, let's, let's pass the code using uh, bulk, right? So as I, as I mentioned, Bulkrind has uh, several tools. The tool that we are going to, ch to use now is called memcheck for checking the memory. So you, you call it Bulkrind dash dash tool equal memcheck, and then the name of the program that you want to run. Okay? And this is what Bulkrind returns. It's very verbose, I told you. It's, it's, it's a bit uh, scary at the beginning and, and cryptic. But basically, we need to, to try to figure out which are the important pieces there. So the first thing to notice is on the left, is the process ID of the, of the program that is right. Okay? And then it has some messages there, like invalid write of size 4. And then it says uh, where in the line was detected. And then uh, same thing, invalid read of size 4. Okay? And again, the line where it was detected. So line 8 and 6 of the code. Okay? So take a look at the code. Go back. So should have numbers. But Four, five, six. Uh, you can see that the 4 goes from i equal 1 up to i less or equal n max. But the array has allocated for n max uh, in indexes, right? So when we reach the last index, it's going out of bounds. So even when the code didn't set 4 because it went just one position out of line, Valgrin is detecting that there is a problem with that index. Okay. Is it clear? So how we fix this, instead of having less or equal, we just have the less. Probably, it's, it's a, it's a, again, it's a very easy fact to catch, but when you have more complex situations, that can be used. Okay, so the third bug that we fix. Okay. Um, this is part of, uh, so let's say that we run by run again, or, or it continues to dump. Um, it says conditional champ or move depends on initialized values. Okay, and as you can see, it's, it's showing a lot of information. This is part of the of the. Remember when we talk about CDB and the and the functions stack? This is the calls that have been done for functions that are not only in the code but in the libraries that you use when you include other functionalities of the standard library. Um, Okay, so it says an use of initialized value size 8, um, and it says line 11. Okay, uh, so again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 11. Here is when it's using SAM. Okay, so basically the problem is SAM, which is going to add all the integers, all the square roots of the integers, hasn't been initialized. Okay. So we need to initialize sum. We do it in the definition itself. So now it's initialized with zero. OK, so it's the fourth bug that we found, fifth, remember now? OK, any bets that if, there is, if there are any more bugs or not in the code? OK, let's try Vibran again. We pass Vibran again. Or this can be just in one pass. It will give you all the results. But let's say, for the sake of the argument, that we do it once a time. We tackle one of these problems once a time. So the last uh, report for Brightgrind is saying heap summary. Okay, and it's saying total heap usage, one allocation, zero frees, 80 bytes allocated, and then says leak summary. Okay, and this will be all zeros, but it's definitely lost. 80 bytes in one block. And the error summary says, well, there are two, four errors, blah, blah, blah. But basically, it's, it's, it's telling you in this line that this one allocation that hasn't been deallocated. Okay? And, the, and the problem is that we forgot to free the dynamic memory uh, of the array that we use. Okay? So we define uh, the array here. Uh, we, we allocate the memory here. But we never include the delete, the deletion of the of the array. Okay, so we found three more bugs just by using Bygram with the memory check. Right? Again, this is a very uh, simple example, but but it's just to show you um, how to use these tools and, and what you can learn from these tools. Okay, so one more time, we we run Bygram now um, with the code fix, and it should, as you can see. 
there are no errors or complaints before, and then the heap summary, the zero bytes in zero blocks, one allocation, one free, so this number should match at the end. Uh, all heap blocks were free, no leaks are possible. Doesn't mean that the code will run just fine and give you the results that you expect. That depends on the logic that you implemented in the code. But from the technical point of view, this code is fine. There is no memory leakage. There are no uh, indices going out of bounds in the arrays, anything like that. OK? Any questions? Yes. Yes. It's, it's, well, you can use both. Right, you, you can use the debugger as we, as we saw at the beginning, and you can use this one. Which one you use first, I, I don't think that matters. It's just how you feel more comfortable. You probably will use the debugger first if you are having a segmentation fault or a crash, or you have a core file that's been created because your code crashed. Uh, usually, bytegrind is used when the code is running, just to double check that everything is fine, that there are no memory leakers. As I said, the memory leakers, unless that you run out of memory in the computer, you, you won't say anything. OK, okay. so we're going to, to talk about another topic, um, which, is, which is kind of related to, to debugging, to profiling, which is the topic that comes after. But this is, is its own topic by its own. And it's very, very close related or correlated with the idea of, of the modularity that we mentioned last week. Um, and, and one of the points of, of this modularity was to have these independent modules, these independent units, that one of the important points is each of these units should be able to be compiled by its own, independently of the rest. And because of that is that we actually can test those units independently. So we are going to learn a tool. It's, again, it's a set of tools uh, that will allow us to do it. Okay? So in particular, this is uh, the Boots C++ library. It's a set of libraries that contains over 80 individual libraries and macros. Includes linear algebra, pseudo-random number generators, multi-threading, image processing, regular expressions, and the one that we are going to focus today is unit testing. Okay, so this one you will have to install. Um, I think there is a link here. Yeah, you can click on that and go to the, the uh, website. Um, as I say, it has a whole set of tools. Um, and in most of the cases are just macros used to validate expressions. And we're going to see several examples of how to do that. Okay? As you probably know now, every time that you use something external, you will need to include uh, that library in your source file. So you will have to have a, a line like that or a similar one. I will show you some, some variations later. Uh, but basically, that's, that's how you include the unit test from the boost. Um, there are three main categories of the tools. Uh, boost warn, that just give you a warning. Boost check, that will check for expressions. And boost require, that if the, the condition is not met, it will just halt your, 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 your test. Okay? In addition to that, you can create several categories. Uh, the, um, the basic one is, is called boost auto test case, which is just a simple test, uh, a, a test case. And then you had Boost auto test suites, and between the suite or within the suite, you can have several test cases. Okay, so in one suite, you, have, you can have several of the, of the test cases. Again, it's going to be a bit more clear with this example. So I have an example here. It's just to show you um, the different ways that you can actually uh, announce this or present the test to the user. So um, one thing that is always suggested and recommended is to define um, the test module and give a name. So that's what I'm doing in the first line, define boost test module. is like this, the same idea of the preprocessor guards, but it's just to identify the test that I have. My, my case, I just give the name my test. Um, then I'm including uh, the unit test, the header of the unit test. And then I'm defining a function, a very simple function. It's the function add, which stays two integers and returns the addition of the two integers. And I want to test that function, right? Now I start my, uh, my test case. So I start by just having one test case, OK? And I call it my test. And I have here six different examples uh, of how to test for the function. It's, it's, it's basically the same way or the same test, but it's different how Boost is going to handle 
uh, the checking and the announcement of the check. Okay, so the first one is going to check that the addition of two and two is four. In the th in the second one, it's going to check but require that the addition of two plus two is is equal to four. And if that doesn't if it does isn't met, it's going to hold the execution. It's going to give you an error and, and stop the program. Okay. Um, the, the next two is just different ways to do the same, uh, error or fail. So you're, you are checking with the if statement, but basically Boos is handling how to communicate that. Okay. The next one is uh, it's just a, a warning if you want. It's Boos check me, uh, message and the condition and then the message that you want to pass. It's kind of a warning. And the final is it's a different way to, to check uh, instead of using if is uh, is equal, so Boost has a macro where you say this first argument is equal to the second argument, and basically check for that. Okay, and at the end you just end uh, the Boost out of test, um, and that should say case instead of sweet. So, okay, how you compile it? C plus plus. You need to include. Uh, the library boost unit test framework and including a new flag, uh, the boost test dynamical link. The, the name of my code is message.cpp. I want to generate the executable message. Um, notice that I'm including this, this flag uh, because I want to dynamical link, dynamically link the library boost with the, with the unit, okay, with, the, with the source code. There is a different way I'm going to show you to, dynamic, to statically link uh, that. Basically, what the difference between the dynamical and the statical way of linking the libraries is when you do the dynamically, it is necessary that the library is in the, in the computer where you're running the program because it's going to, during runtime, going to look for the library. When you statically link, it takes the part of the library that is using and it puts embedded in the source code. So it's not necessarily the library. Okay. And then I run my code, okay, my unit, and it says running one test, one test case, no errors detected. Okay, looks simple. It's a simple example just for, for warming up, but basically that's kind of the things you can do. Okay, questions? All good. Okay, let's see another example. This is a bit more fun. Floating points. We're going to test floating point operations. Okay. Again, I'm defining uh, the name of my boost test module, floating point test. I'm including, and notice now that I'm, um, let me see if I, yeah, I'm including a different um, header file. This one is a boost test include unit test HP. The other didn't have to include. The difference is that I'm going to be able to compile statically the boost libraries in this case. I'm including the seed math because I'm going to use some math here. I'm defining my suite case, my, my test suite and my test case. And what I'm doing is basically defining a variable, floating point variable, a real variable F1 equal to a given number. I'm going to define, uh, to compute the result of the square root of that number. And I'm going to ask boost to check if the original number is equal to the square root of the number times the square root. Okay. I compile. Notice that I'm not including the library now, neither the flag, because I have, the, I have already uh, added the inclusion of the, of the statically linked um, uh, header. I run the code, and surprise, the test fails. Okay. Why do you think it failed? It could be that I just have a bug, but in this case, it's a very simple case. Yep. Yeah, this is one of these cases where you need to be aware of the floating point arithmetics and the precision. Okay, and Boost knows about that. So there is an alternative way to implement this test, and this is usually if you have to test uh, units when you are using floating point arithmetics, and is to use um, boost check close fraction. 
Okay, so the, the code is basically the same. The only thing I change here is the way that I'm asking Boost to check for the result. Instead of using Boost check, I'm using Boost check close fraction. So now I'm asking to compare the first argument of the macro with the second argument of the macro given a given, uh, with a given tolerance. This case is uh, 10 to the minus 4. Okay? And again, I'm going to compile the code, run the code, and in this case, there is no error. Okay? But it's important that, that you are aware of that. Right? Uh, another example is a bit more um, elaborate. It's about um, it's using objects and, and places. So we are going to, to go ahead, and you can uh, review this by your own later and, and, and ask questions if you want. Um, but basically, it's defining a class and some uh, methods associated with the class. I think the last lecture from this module is going to be about objects, right? Maybe worth it to review this at the end. Um, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a case just to, to show you how to include um, and to use the, the macros defined in the boost library. Okay? And in these three dots there should be the whole pass. It didn't fit in my slide. The last uh, thing I want to let you know is how to uh, compile. It's just basically a review of what I was telling you before, how to compile and include the boost libraries. So one way to do it is to use the statically um, defined macros. So you include uh, boost test, include unit test, and then the compilation doesn't require anything else. These things between brackets are optional. So it means that if you are using GSL, the scientific library, or BLAST, you add those. But if you are not using anything of that, you don't need those. Okay? So the only thing that you need is the name of the executable and the functions that you're using and the, and, and the main file. Right? The other option is to, is to generate dynamically linked uh, unit tests for which you don't use the include uh, directory here. And then you add the flag uh, dput test, uh, ding link. Or the other option, which is also for generating dynamically linked um, unit tests, is to use the original ones, but then define this, um, this uh, variable within the, uh, the unit that you want to test. Okay, and you add the minus L view uh, boost unit test. Frame. Right? Any questions? Good. Okay, so this concludes the bugging lecture. Now we are going to go to filing. Okay. So we are going to try to review very quickly, what is profiling, some tools that are already available for you for, for measure the performance of your code. And then we're going to have two particular or two specialized tools, Chipprof and Bygrind again, uh, for looking a bit more into that. Okay, profiling. Uh, profiling is, is, is a methodical uh, discipline of measuring how your code performs, basically, how, how efficient. It is how fast it is, but more importantly, how fast it, how fast it can be. Okay? Basically, the idea is you can't improve anything until you measure and compare with, with different techniques and, 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 and try different things. So it's kind of a, it's a process, right? So you, you find bottlenecks or part of the costs that are slow, you make improvements, you measure, you do that again and again and again. Okay? So profiling will help for that, for improving the performance of your code. Basically, a question that is behind is uh, where in your program is the time being spent? Find the expensive parts, that's what we call usually bottlenecks, um, and don't waste time optimizing parts that actually don't matter. So this is relative to what you are doing and, and how your code beh uh, behaves. There are two different ways or two different techniques for profile codes, for profiling codes, tracing and sampling. Basically, in tracing, you follow step by step what the code is doing. Okay? As you can imagine, this somehow uh, is very slower, slower, will make your code run slower, but it will give you very detailed information of what the code is doing and how is it doing. The sampling, on the other hand, is less intrusive. It basically takes samples given a certain period of time, 
but it requires that your statistics are large, as in any statistic case. Basically, you need to have a lot of samples to have a good number uh, of measurements and have good statistics. Additionally, you can have uh, measurements that are instrumented versus non-instrumented. Basically, I don't know if you can see, it's very, very bad the code, but basically, there are parts of the code that you can put routines that measure uh, the initial time of the computer when the, the, the session or the routine started to run, and, and at the end, have a, a clock and compare these two times and tell you how long did the routine or how long the routine took to uh, run. Okay? So we are going to see examples of that. So the first, the first example is, is, a, is a command that is available in most OSs, in MobX term as well, I think, right? Time? Yeah, it should be. Uh, so the time command basically tells you for how long a program run. Okay? It's very simple. You just type time, and then the, run, the name of your program and basically will give you three different times. One is the real time, or the time that the actual code run, the total time, if you want. Then you have the user time, which is actually the time that the code uses. And then you have the system time. This is related to operations of uh, input output, saving files, these kind of things. Okay? But it's a good idea to have, to have those three numbers, in particular, because if this number is comparable to that one, you already know that the I.O. is very heavy in your code. Okay? The input-output operations are heavy. So you need to keep an eye on that. Um, uh, what else? So you can, you can try to run time several times and have an idea if, if the code is stable in what is running, run with different sample sizes and see how it scales, those kind of things. Okay. Another command which is very handy is top. So again, you press, you type top while your code is running, and basically you will get on a screen like this. In this case, we are looking at a, a code that is run by uh, the user L shade Darcy. Um, you see that the process ID, which is the left column, is all different because it's a multi-thread call. But basically, there are different things you can look at this. Uh, so the first line, or the line that is uh, surrounded by the, by the red uh, circle, uh, will tell you different things. It tells you how much of the CPU time is used by the code. Uh, that's the user, 11.4%. And then how much is used by the sys, by the system, 2%. And in this case, because the, the, the system time uh, is way more than the user time, clearly this is not that too efficient. There is more information like how much percentage of the CPU each of these uh, threads is using, the percentage of memory that the code is using. So there is a lot of information there going on. Uh, so that is another thing that, that, um, that sometimes can be handy to have a first glance uh, to the performance of the code. Questions? No? So those are no invasive uh, methods of measuring performance. A bit more invasive is to include uh, instrumentations in part of the, of the code. Um, here I have an example of the TikTok uh, methods, basically are used for, for measuring when a routine starts, when the routine ends, and compute the time elapsed uh, that took to run that routine. Um, it's simple, it's really simple, it's simple as it looks there. It's basically getting the time, uh, calculating the time, getting the time of the day, and computing that, okay? Runs every time that your code is run, because it's part of your code now. It requires to be embedded in the code, uh, but it can, it can see things, uh, or it can, it can see if you change things, if they are making the code run better or worse, and you can very clearly determine in which pieces of the code the time is being spent. Okay. So let's take a look at an example. I don't know if you guys can see this in the slides, looks a bit better. Um, so this is a, an example of a code that does a very simple matrix vector multiplication. What it's doing here is in the first part is initializing the vector and the matrix. Um, 
it multiplies them, and then it saves the data uh, in a file. Okay? And you can see there are implementations of the, of the, um, of the timers, uh, initialize, and the, so this is the tick, this is the talk, tick, there should be a talk at the bottom. Okay? So we are going to measure each of these parts. Initialization, multiplication, and out. Basically, you split the, the, the code in three pieces. Okay? Okay. So I call this, uh, this program MBM, uh, matrix vector multiplication. Uh, you can pass a parameter, which is the matrix size. Um, and then using this, uh, these timers, embedded in the code, we get the following um, results. For the initialization, it's using almost uh, 9 milliseconds. For the computation itself, it's uh, 0 0.07 seconds. And for the I.O., it's using 5 seconds. So clearly, uh, the time is, the code is spending most of this time doing uh, I.O. Okay? It's, it's a huge bottleneck. It's like 100 times uh, larger than, than the computation itself. Okay? So let's see what can we do. So first, no, first thing to notice, oh, here is bad. First thing to notice is, um, and I'm sorry, this is a C, standard C version. So it's not using the C++ operator, but it's kind of the same idea. So the first thing to, that you can notice is that the input output, so the, the, the data is being saved in ASCII, in text. Okay. Um, and there are a couple of things there to notice. It's like, we, we haven't talked about I.O. yet, but we are going to have a, a lecture on that probably a couple of weeks. Every time that you say something in text, what is happening, especially when it's a floating point variable, what is happening underneath is that value is being converted. And there is time that is being consumed for doing that. In addition to that, we're going to see that it's, 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 it takes way more space in this than, having, than saving the things in binary. Okay? So for, for this matrix, we have two loops, two embedded loops that cover the matrix. And every time that the, the, the value of the element of the matrix is converted, is spending time there. So basically, for that matrix, uh, 2500 by 2500, is spending almost six, it's, it's doing basically six million operations uh, when writing the matrix to the, to the disk. Okay? So one thing that we can try, just by looking at the numbers of the time that was spent in each of the routines, is to try to say this in a binary format instead of, a, of an ASCII form. Okay? So the binary format looks like this. For saving the, the matrix in a binary uh, format looks just like this. Um, it's very simple. It's way simpler than, than, than what we have for writing the, the matrix in, in ASCII. And let's, let's measure that. Let's compare that with the, with the ASCII option. Uh, so I run now the code. It has an option for running, for saving. Um, the data in binary, and you can see that the I.O. was decreased like norm. It's, it's uh, 36 times faster than before, just by, by saving the things in binary. If I com if not only that, if I compare the sizes, and I'm sorry, this is a typo. The first thing like here should be asked. If you run uh, the call with the ASCII option, and you look at the size, it's 89 megabytes. But if you run the, the code with the binary option, it's just 20 megabytes. So in terms of size, it's four times as small. OK? So that's, that's one of the, of the first lessons that you can learn from, from, this code, from this course, if you want to take any. Always, always use a binary format for I.O. OK? The truth is, even if you, if you have, especially when you have large files, you're never going to look at it. By doing a cut or a more in the file, right? The data will be there. You are going to process it somehow. You're going to read with another program. So it will save you time and it will save you space in the disk. Okay? Any questions?
So let's, uh, so this is basically uh, tracing, right? Because I instrumented the code, I, I, I know exactly what parts of the code is doing. Uh, let's take a look at the, at the tools that we have for some. Um, it will allow us to, to get a final grain or detailed information about where the time is being spent. The truth is, is you have a very long, very long piece of code. You cannot instrument every single line or every single function. It will take you a lot of time. And actually, the compilers are aware of this and have tools for, for sampling execution paths. Okay. Um, so one of the things I, I mentioned, um, you need to be aware of, of how long a code ta uh, takes to run uh, in order to have a, or, or have a very long run in order to have a good sample. Um, so let's, let's look at, um, so one of the advantages um, of, of sampling is it has less overhead at the instrumentation because it's, very, it's less intrusive. It doesn't require extra instrumentation at all. Um, the disadvantage is because you have just samples and you don't know exactly where the code was doing what, uh, you don't know exactly where, where, uh, why the code was there. And as I say, you need a lot of statistics. You have to run long enough uh, the code such that you can get insights of what is going. So um, one of the tools that you can use for this is Shiprov. The only thing that you need to do is to, when you compile the code, you need to add some extra flags. Uh, we saw last time the minus she, which basically includes the symbols for debugging, so makes things easy when you, when you are in the debugger to identify the variables. So it's not required by itself, but it's helpful because it can give you more idea of what is going on there. So it has the symbols, the name of the variables there. And minus PC uh, basically turns on the, the profiling features. Okay, so when you basically, I, I'm using here a very um, aggressive optimization. It's O3, we usually use O2, but in this case, I, I wanted to try O3. But you can usually just do uh, minus PC and the optimization you usually use. So I compile, either with the Intel or the new compilers. I run the program again, and at the end, you will see that there is a new file called shimon.tab. That's the file that contains the information of the profile. Okay, and that's the file that shiprov, that utility that we're going to use, will need in order to analyze the profile or, or give you the information in the profiling of the, of the code. So basically, the way to run is you call shiprov, um, you call, so the executable I, I generated with the, with the profiling option zone is called um, MBM uh, profile. So I call the name of the executable and then shimon.tab. Similar to how shdb handles the core files. You call the, the tool, the name of the executable, and then uh, shimon.tab or core. The process ID. And basically what it tells you here is, it's a very simple output. It's the time. Uh, that is being spent, and it breaks by functions. It's, it's a split by functions. So it tells you, okay, the main function here is using 100% uh, of the time. Then the TikToks instrumentations that I did for measuring is using fractions of that. And then our calls from the, from the functions uh, from the system, from the libraries, basically the allocation, the free allocation free. Um, as you can notice, my code wasn't too modular. Uh, so they didn't have too much function, just the TikTok function, right? It's not giving me much information about that. But usually when you have a modular code, as you should, it will give you the information of how much time each function is spent. However, because I wanted to show something here, there is another option how you can run shiprov that is use uh, the minus minus line option. So when you run shiprov minus minus line, Name of the executable, shimon dot uh, and then you pipe it with more just to have the first screen there. It will tell you which of the lines are spending most of the time. And in this case, you can see that line 82 and 113 are the ones that are taking most of the time. 82 is taking almost 70% uh, of the time, the other one 15%. Okay, so in the case that you want just to look at one function and, and provide that function, you can use minus minus line if you don't have functions. Like in my spaghetti, not good example of call. You can use minus minus line. Okay, let's take a quick look 
of those lines, okay, 992, which is, was around 15%, is just the multiplication. Basically, the arithmetic that is going on in the code, right? Line 113, for surprise, is when it's saving the things in the, in, the, in the file, in the old way, when I was using ASCII. So I was profiling the old code. Okay? So this is another indication that the I.O. is very intensive and is taking a lot of the time from the, from the code. Okay? So you see, I could have detected this by instrumenting the code with the TikToks functions, or I could have detected this by using cheaper. Right? So some of the features of Shiprof, it says it's almost everywhere. If you, if you have installed the compilers, it's probably already there for you. Uh, it's easy to script and, and include in your batch shops. It has a very low overhead. And with, as, as happens, with, with some of the debugger has different uh, GUIs that you can use. And make things pretty and show you plots and things like that. Okay. Um, any questions? So most of the profilers, the metric, the, the way to measure the performance is to, to, to basically uh, take a look at the time that the code is, is using. But another thing about performance or another uh, feature that you can uh, care about the performance is your code is how much memory it's using, if it is a memory hog or not. And basically, one thing that, that uh, the profiling will allow you to determine if, if your problem or the code that you are using is, is what is called memory bound or CPU bound, what is more eager of the resources from, from processing and computing or resources from the memory? Okay. So, Balgrind, again, our dear friend, and by the way, Balgrind is free. Okay. So, if you are able to, to have a Linux watch, you can download it for free. Um, Offer against uh, two more tools that are very nice. For, for looking at the, at the memory profile. Uh, one is called MACIP, which is, uh, basically will return you a memory heap profile. Okay? And the other one is Cache Profiler. Um, there's a nice uh, GUI for, for, for this tool. It's called KCacheGrind. Um, I include some slides at the end. I don't think we will have time. So it's a bit more advanced of topics because it's related to how, um, how the memory is organized. So you have the main memory of the computer, and you have a bit a smaller chunk of memory, a bit a smaller pool of memory called cache, and that memory is very fast. So if you, if you are able to allocate the data that you are using in your program in that chunk of memory, cache, your, mem your program will run fast. Okay? And, and, and profiling that part of the, of, of the memory is, is, is it's very interesting and, and can help you to improve the, the performance and the speed of your code. So there's a couple of slides about that at the end. Um, so let's, let's uh, look at uh, Bygram Macy. Um, so basically, the way that you run it is you call Bygram, you choose the tool Macy, and you run the code. And then you need uh, to basically digest the results produced by, by Bygram. You need to use MS Sprint. And you call the, the file called massive.out, which is the output of, of the Bygram produced for you. And this is how it looks like. Uh, again, can be a bit cryptic, uh, but basically it shows you uh, how the memory was used. It shows you, um, it's doing repetition, so it shows you the number of samples in the first column, it shows you the, uh, the time, uh, the total memory, and then it tells you where it was used which calls it was used. Okay. Um, there are other profiling tools. Um, some of them are, are not free, so you need to pay for them. If you had a Mac, you probably have something in the index calls. Uh, there is the suite from Intel. Um, there is the Alinea uh, tools. There are some tools more aimed for parallel processing. Um, so these are just a list, probably not complete of all of them, but it's um, So just a quick summary. Um, just a review of what we mentioned today. You can put your own timers in your code. 
uh, in the important sections. Um, you can find them where the time is being spent. Uh, if something changed, uh, you probably can identify in which section that changed. Shiprof is easy to use and excellent at finding where the time is spent. Try to know in advance which parts of the code may be more expensive and spend uh, time trying to improve the things that need to be improved. Um, something that, that um, probably you had noticed in this after the I.O. was converted into a binary format. Uh, one of the things that was at the same level was the initialization, but there is not much that you can do in the initialization. Okay, so when you reach certain point, uh, it's, it's basically what it is, okay? Pygon is a, is a swift knife, basically provides you several tools. We saw it like uh, for, for detecting memory leakage, but also for, for performance and, and profiling memory as well. One thing I, I just want to let you know about is that on March 16, we're going to be hosting a virtual seminar at, at the offices at Signet. So everyone is more than welcome to attend. It's about one of the products that you can use. Uh, it's available for, on Signet. So that's it's a, it's a product, it's a commercial product, but it has license for, for using uh, the DDT debugger. So uh, Alinea is going to give uh, some presentations about their parallel profiling and performance tools. So you just need to register and, and you're more than welcome to come. Uh, questions? Questions? Okay. So we have five more minutes. So I just want to, these are the slides I was talking before. It's a bit advanced of, so it requires some digest, uh, uh, but basically, the thing that I want to show you, this is a explanation of how things work. But this is the part I want to show you. I think that we mentioned, we mentioned in the introduction, I think um, that C is, a, C is a raw major language, right? And what this has to deal with that is um, by looking at, uh, let me put one of these. Um, so let's say this part here is, is the main memory of the computer, okay? The, the white rectangle on the top is the cache. Okay? So that is a smaller chunk of memory, faster memory, closer to the processor, where the data can be retrieved very quickly. Okay? So the idea is, OK, I cannot put all my data there because it doesn't fit. Okay? It's smaller. So how can I read a huge structure like a matrix in an in a, in a optimized way? Okay? So if you, if you do in the usual way, where you allocate memory checks continuously, what will happen is, OK, if I had to jump from one, um, from one element here to this other element, basically what the computer is going to do is will load this first chunk here, but it won't have access to this other. Okay? It depends how, I, how I'm jumping in the elements on the matrix. Now, if I'm jumping from rows or from columns, it depends, right? Because I can read this element here and read the whole line and then read the other whole line and so on. So that's initially doesn't matter, right? And, and when you do that and when you need the next element, it sometimes it's called um, cache miss. But it, it matters in the way how you implement the loops. So by, by changing the order of the loops of the inner four and the outer four of the loop, Basically, you can avoid having this, this misses of the cache. Okay. Again, it's, it's kind of, of, of a tricky and advanced thing. It's, it's something to think about. But sometimes, by just switching the order of the loops, will allow you to have an increase in performance. And I just want to show you the result, the result somewhere. Here. Um, remember the calculation, this one, the part of the computation? So you can reduce by a factor of 10 roughly, just by shuffling around the order of the folds. I know it's a lot to, to, to think about, but, but it's part of how, how performance and, and improving performance goes. OK? Sorry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, one thing that you need to be aware of, depending on the language, like Fortran is column major, 
uh, C straw mail, right? So what I'm trying to say is, if you are using Fortran, probably this will be better than this. But in C, you first cover by rows and then you jump to, to the next. Okay. The third assignment will be posted today, sometime in the afternoon. Um, any questions? Luckily, today we are finishing on time. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, guys.